A tourist entered a large city, and he passed by a desk clerk. The desk clerk said, Hello, sir. Come on in and tell me about yourself. The tourist responded and said, Well, I'm from the east and recently arrived here in this big city in the west. The desk clerk said, Well, what brought you this way? The tourist said, well, I was a contractually binded employee and I just got sick of my job and so now I'm here. Now with a furrowed brow, the desk clerk said, you were a contractually binded employee. How did you get out of your contract with your boss? The tourist, now a little bit nervous, said, well, funny, uh, I didn't. I just left and I don't know why I'm telling you this, but I may have depleted the register before I left. In fact, I took a lot of my boss's money. Well, now the desk clerk moved with compassion. He said to him, just out of curiosity, young man, what was your boss's name? The tourist said his name was Mr. Mon. Phil E. Mon. Wait, 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 wait. You're talking about the Phil E. Mon? I know Mr. Mon. In fact, not only do I know him, but I led him to Christ and he's a wonderful Christian man. And oh, his wife, Afia, is such a sweetheart. Now tell me, is the church still meeting in their house? The tourist, now embarrassed, says, yes, that's them. And yes, sir, the church does meet in their house. The desk clerk said, young man again, what's your name? And he said, Onesimus. And the clerk responded, my name is Paul of Tarsus, and I'd like to visit with you a little bit because I think God has big plans in store for you. Well, this little parody is what may have happened in order to bring Onesimus into contact with Paul. Paul, the apostle set apart by the Lord Jesus Christ, was imprisoned in Rome And some way or another, he encounters a runaway slave named Onesimus. And now, after leading him to Christ and some time together in discipleship and ministry, he's going to send him back, back to his master, back to his owner, his employer, if you will, as an act of reconciliation within the family of God. So if you've got a Bible, turn over to Philemon. Philemon, it's tucked in just before the book of Hebrews in your New Testament. <clears throat> just one chapter. And let's begin in this little short study. We're going to cover the entire book today, but I want to look at just the first few verses to begin. Again, these are God's words for us this morning, beginning in verse 1. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Philemon was an owner. He lived near Colossae, and Onesimus was his bond servant who had run away. And now here in this letter, Paul is writing to his friend Philemon. He begins with an introduction and then follows it with a praise. Then there's a plea and then there's a pledge before he concludes at the end. And the reason I was drawn to this letter is because we saw Second John two weeks ago where the theme is a, a community around God's word, a growing community, if you will. Third John was, hey, you need to be hospitable to new people. And we call that open homes and open hearts. But there's something, guys, that will stop us dead in our tracks. We will fail to see a family form and will, in fact, experience civil war. We'll be our own worst enemy. And here it is, if we are unable to work through conflict. So Philemon, we're going to throw a tag on it and call it fellowship and forgiveness, or really fellowship through forgiveness, because Philemon shows us how to both create fellowship and sustain it through reconciling in the gospel's power. So let me at the front end give you the big idea, and then I'll walk through and develop this for us. The gospel's power is on display in us by producing and preserving a church family. We, the church, are called to be the gospel made visible. We are the people of God and as such a family. And Philemon shows us how a family should act amidst conflict, clashing, 
and hurt. And so I want to show you from Philemon six familial ties. When asking the question, God, why is this book here? I believe there's lessons, timeless truths, big ideas, really sanctifying grace. And we're going to package it under six familial ties to keep us unified, to keep our family a family. The six ties are humility, gentleness, repentance, forgiveness, compassion, and trust. Point number one then is humility. Specifically, family ties are produced and preserved when humility is expressed in relation. And so Paul launches into this little letter with a commendation beginning in verse four. He says, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the, f- of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. Now, maybe you've heard it said that if you're going to say something constructive or mean, you need to surround it by a compliment or a commendation. And others today would suggest a five to one rule. You need to say five positives for every one negative. Well, Paul is the inventor of the five to one rule except for in Galatians. But here, he, maybe not in Galatians, right? But, but here, Paul is really saying some truly kind things about this man, Philemon. He commends him for, in verse four, his love, rather in verse five, for his love, for his faith toward the Lord Jesus, for his love for the saints, and even for his personal encouragement to Paul himself. And then still really within an encouraging note, I believe he moves to a prayer. And in this prayer in verse six, he says the phrase, I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective. Now, this little term sharing is the Greek word koinonia. And I only tell you that because you've maybe heard that. It's a fairly common uh, Greek word, even in our culture today. Koinonia means fellowship. Fellowship or commonality. And it's really the commonality in the faith. And guys, here's what I want to tell you. Fellowship in the faith changes everything. Now understand that in the first century, there were classes. In fact, one third of the Greco-Roman world were slaves. They were bond servants. Now this, this is different than our country's past experience with slavery. These slaves uh, they could have a pretty good life. They worked and they would be sometimes let go and they would re-up their contract. In fact, some slaves could even own property, but they were still property themselves. And so Onesimus is not only a runaway slave, which is worthy of capital punishment, but he is also a thief. So he could have been branded with an F or fugitive on his forehead or even killed. But here's the point. Christian fellowship blows up societal constructs. While not directly addressing slavery here, he does, the Apostle Paul, address gospel living and the impact it has on how we treat people regardless of their class or standing or race even. And so what I think Paul is saying in verse 6 is he's praying for humility for his friend Philemon to view Onesimus in relation to the truth. Philemon, he's a brother and he's a friend. He's not property or a convict. In Doxa Church, I want to say this is what we need more of too. We need humility. Humility in how we view ourselves. Humility in how we view others. Humility in how we relate as a church. And the opposite of this is pride. Pride will sever familial ties. Where there is pride, trust is broken Family ties are severed and friendship is lost. But if we will be a people who live in humility within this fellowship, we will be an incredible display of God's gospel power. Why? Because we'll be the recipients of his divine grace. James 4, 6 says that God gives grace to the humble. And so he prays this in verse six for this kind of humility. And it's interesting that he talks about the the benefits, if you will, of his fellowship with Philemon. Verse seven, for I've derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. 
And I think verse 7 gives us a little window into some of the effects when there is true fellowship. There's joy and comfort and love and refreshment. And listen, friends, isn't that what you want said of you? I would love for this church to be a place where fellowship is real, where church family forms because of the gospel, and where things like these in verse 7 are said of us. But it requires humility. Humility. So the gospel's power is on display in us by producing and preserving a church family, but that only happens when humility is expressed in relation with one another. Number two from this little letter, is that familial ties are produced and preserved when gentleness is felt in conversation. Now, in the Tebow household, we play a game, kind of like a little kid version of Fugitive, where we turn off all the lights in the house and it's nighttime, and the kids start on one side of the house, and they have to make it to the other side of the house, through several rooms in the hallway, into the master bathroom, into the bath. That's where they're safe. And I am the bad guy, and I've got to try to get them on the way. Now, listen, there are some spots where I'll hide that are just cruel. It's just unkind. I could do it, but it would scare the bejeebers out of them and probably traumatize them for a very long time. And so, though I have the power really to make them probably scared for a very long time, because of kindness, because of gentleness, ultimately because of love, I choose not to. Well, that's a little bit of a window into, <laughs> into the same sort of ability to do something, but the meekness to withhold it that we see from our friend Paul in verse 8. <clears throat> Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus. Notice the gentleness, the kindness, the meekness, virtues that are by and large missing today. Guys, isn't it amazing how our tone can affect conversation? It's one thing to walk in the house and say, what's for dinner tonight? It's another to say, hey, sweetie, what do we got for dinner tonight? And it's another, and what we should probably do is to walk in and say, sweetie, love of my life, would you mind if I made dinner tonight? Right, but here's the thing. Instead, what we tend to do is we pick up the tone, even the disposition, the edginess of our coworkers, our neighbors, even our family. That's how my mom and dad always did it. Or in in the workplace. That's how my boss always spoke to me. And so as a consequence, we become hardened to this. But thankfully, gentleness is not a static state. It's not something that you have or that you don't have. It's something you can grow in, that you can cultivate, even pursue. And why it matters for you here this morning is just this. Just your marriage, your parenting, the effectiveness of your singleness, your joy. Guys, that we as a church might actually be a family that forms and shines forth the gospel power brightly by running from gossip, from slander, from harshness. In fact, these kinds of biting words will be that which will actually overrule gospel power meant to be on display in us because of God's grace given to us. So, Docs, I want to ask you, what are you willing to do for love's sake? That's what he said in verse 9. For love's sake, I'll appeal. What are you willing to do? What are you willing to become? Are you willing to overlook a matter? To withhold the thing that you're thinking for the sake of love? Isn't it 1 Peter 4, 8 that says love covers a multitude of sins? And Proverbs 19, 11 that says it's a glory to overlook an offense? Are you willing to together pursue kindness and gentleness? Friends, are you willing to start with your spouse and with your kids in your own home and then to let that overflow into the way we interact as church family? I'm talking about gentleness, people. I have a friend and a mentor. His name is Brian Hughes. And he says, when you find a friend who's kind, keep them close. 
and men and women here this morning, I want to tell you, we should be that friend for other people. If we will pursue gentleness and kindness in conversation, we will set the stage for meaningful reconciliation and a greater fellowship. So we are tied together as a family. Family ties are produced and preserved when gentleness is felt in conversation. But number three, and this one is important, family ties are produced and preserved when repentance is seen in action. Notice verse 11, he says, Verse 11, formerly he was useless to you, but now he's indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. Now, apparently Onesimus had been born again under the ministry of the Apostle Paul in this happenstance, which we know as providential meeting. And not only that, but he had become useful to him in ministry, he says. In fact, he was loved by Paul. Look at verse 10. He says, not only is he useful to me, but in verse 10, I became his father. If you look at verse 12, he says, I'm sending my very heart. And down in verse 16, he's a beloved brother. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I put myself in Paul's shoes, it would have been easy to have justified this. To have said, listen, Oni, (laughs) I don't know what he called him, Oni, uh, you're all the way here in Rome. I know you ran away, but Philemon's my friend. He'll understand Why don't we just make sure that you repent before the Lord, you confess it, and let's move forward. Let's build an empire here in Rome. You can be my runner boy while I'm in prison, and we will save so many souls. But that's not what he did. Look at verse 13. I would have been glad to keep him here with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. Paul sent him back. His repentance was seen in action. And guys, I think I want to ask you this morning, do we do this? Do we allow pragmatics to replace principle? The warning of this passage, I believe, is don't let it, especially on gospel issues, right? Repentance can't be chalked up to just feeling bad or throwing up a prayer and then moving on. But repentance needs to be seen in action, which is then met with restitution. Repentance stems from the heart and leads to transformation. So here it is. If you've never heard this, a re- to repent is literally to rethink or reconsider, namely to rethink God's standard of holiness, to rethink your own sin, and to rethink the judgment or the, the righteous judgment that lies upon you. But then it's the rethinking that results in a changing, in a turning of your own self. So it's a change of mind that results in a change in direction. And according to Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, that he says to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. So repentance should lead to ultimate life change. And linking that back to Philemon, I think that means that repentance should result in both reconciliation and restitution. Now, guys, here's the principle for us. When, when we've sinned against another person, this is not just a formula. It's not walking through uh, the hoop, so to speak, but there should be a clear confession. There should be genuine sympathy and there should be resolution. Once in a while, as a husband, I will get it right and I will, I'm saying really once in a while, <laughs> I'll swing by the store on the way home and I will get my sweet wife some chocolate covered strawberries. Now, as I present the chocolate-covered strawberries to her, there's obviously great gratitude. But here's what happens. I usually buy more than we need, and there's leftovers. And in my weakness, I tend to walk by the fridge later that night or early the next morning, and there's those chocolate-covered strawberries presenting themselves once again. And in my weakness, I usually end up eating all of them. Now, and when I go to my wife, this conversation could go one of two ways. On the one hand, I could say, honey, I'm sorry, but they just look so good. Or honey, I'm sorry, but you hadn't eaten them yet. 
And in that case, what I'm doing is I'm actually making a defense. I'm literally apologizing for my actions. Now, what a true reconciliation process would look like would actually be me going to God first and saying, Lord, I have not fulfilled your God-given role for me as a husband. I have eaten the gift that I gave to my wife. Please forgive me. And then it would be me going to my wife and saying, honey, I am so sorry for eating the chocolate-covered strawberries. I acted in selfishness, and I should not have eaten the strawberries. Will you please forgive me? (laughs) Now, Doc's the church on a serious note. This is the thing that's going to make this church live. If we will cultivate a spirit and a culture of repentance that is active, those who talk the talk, but even walk the walk, then I believe we will see life come about in this church. Listen, can we just agree right now we're going to offend one another? But can we also agree that we're still going to be friends and that we're going to commit now to working through it? We cannot be the church that simply sweeps conflict under the rug, that puts on our happy Sunday faces, and that pretends like everything is fine until all of a sudden it's explosively not fine. Let's ahead of time commit, guys, to a genuine communication and to a repentance that results in action. If we'll be that type of people who repent and actually make changes based on God's word, our gospel witness will become more and more pronounced and our family ties will strengthen and our fellowship will become sweeter. Look back at your, at your Bible at verse 15. I think Paul's alluding to this when he says, for this perhaps is why he was parted for you for a while that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. You see, Paul was willing to take action based on principle, and he's doing it for their benefit, for their reconciliation, that they might experience the fullness of relationship in Christ. And guys, I want to tell you, that is my constant prayer for you. That God would spare us from division. That he would produce in us humility and gentleness and sensitivity where we're readily accepting our faults, asking for forgiveness and reconciling. Where there's repentance that's met with action. So the gospel's power is on display in us by producing and preserving a family. And these family ties exist when first, humility is expressed in relation, when second, gentleness is felt in conversation, and third, when repentance is seen in action. But this leads to a fourth point that is the other side of the coin. And not only does there need to be repentance, but there needs to be forgiveness. So number four is that family ties are produced and preserved when forgiveness is extended in resolution. Look at, look at verse 17. Paul says, If you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand and I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. See, Paul had led Philemon to Christ and now as a father in the faith, He could have used that as leverage, and he kind of does. He knew there was affection toward him, appreciation, even indebtedness. And so though he doesn't command it, he does. I find it humorous. He says, I'm not commanding this, but don't forget, you owe me. Uh, But here's the point. In an incredible way, Paul is standing in as a surrogate Christ. And in so doing, he is presenting the gospel. Paul's literally saying, whatever has been wronged, apply it to my account as his substitution. And in this way, this is where this is significant for us. He is equating forgiveness as a gospel issue, as a gospel issue. If you'll turn back to Matthew chapter 18, Matthew chapter 18, you have this uh, church restoration or church discipline process of how to deal with sin when it happens within the family of God. You take one, and if he doesn't answer, you take two to present the sin. 
But then Peter comes up in Matthew 18, 21 and says, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him as many as seven times? Well, for the Pharisees, it would have been three. The rule was three times and no more. And so Peter assumes Jesus might have more grace than them. And he doubles it and adds one for good measure. But Jesus says in 22, no, 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 Peter, not seven times, but 70 times, seven times. In other words, an infinite number of times. And then he launches into this parable that is most interesting. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not repay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payments to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and it will, and I will repay everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants that owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him. Now, quick context. <clears throat> a talent is a year's wage. So the first servant owed 10,000 years worth of wages. That's a debt of tens and tens of millions of dollars. But his servant, his fellow servant, owed him a hundred denarii. And denarii is just a day's wage. So a hundred days worth of wages. And yet what he does is it says he goes and chokes him and says, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will repay you. But he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. Well, when his fellow servant saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said, you wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. And here's the point. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Guys, here's the message you need to hear is that we risk divine judgment when we knowingly withhold forgiveness. Why? Because true believers readily forgive as those who perpetually live in a state of forgiveness. This is why Ephesians 4.32 says, forgive one another as Christ has forgiven you. And Doxa Church, if we're going to live with the gospel power on display through us, we've got to forgive one another in the same way God's forgiven us. How's God forgiven us? Well, he's taken our sin and separated it as far as from the east is from the west. He's taken our sin and put it at the bottom of the ocean, and he's chosen to remember it no more, to forget it, and he asks us to do the same. And, and so if you'll return to Philemon, I think forgiveness, when we do it in a gospel-centered way, in a way like we've been forgiven, the result of it is incredible. This is why Paul says in verse 20 of Philemon, Brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart. Refresh my heart. Guys, forgiveness is like a cup of soothing tea when you have a sore throat. It's the release of pent-up anxiety and anger, frustration and hurt. Here it is in a word. Paul says it. It's refreshment. It's refreshment. And it's God's intended means of grace for us as a church family. So I think that another familial tie that will help us to experience fellowship and help us to be a gospel witness on display is when forgiveness is extended in resolution. But there's more here, just a few more verses and two more points. I think Paul takes it a step further in that family ties are produced and preserved when compassion is embodied in restoration he says in 21, confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. Now, I know we can all relate to doing the bare minimum. <laughs> when you were a kid and your parents asked you to clean your room, you sometimes moved one sock and you took a few toys and hucked them under the bed. And that was your version of cleaning the room. But that's not really the heart of the command. And in the same way, 
True biblical reconciliation is not doing the mere, the bare minimum. It's actually going above and beyond. And just to cite for you three examples of this from the scriptures, the first is Luke chapter 15 with the prodigal son. When the son runs away and squanders his inheritance and tarnishes his father's name and then repents, not only does the father forgive him, and restore with him, but there's actually compassion for his son. He runs out to him. He clothes him in his purple garment. He gives him his signet ring, and he embraces him again as family. He slaughters the fattened calf, and he throws a party for his son. Now, this parable is about the way that God forgives us with compassion and lavish love, and it's to be an example for how we relate to others. The second example, though, is Hosea and Gomer. And if you remember the story, there's infidelity within the marriage over and over again. And yet there's an overall compassion towards sin, even when there's been personal hurt or personal uh, sin and shame. And then, of course, Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 commands all disciples of his to go the extra mile, to turn the other cheek, to move beyond mere resolution, and actually to extend compassion toward a restoration. So I think this is what Paul's getting at in Philemon when he asks him, actually, he's confident that he'll do even more than what he's saying. Guys, this is going to be necessary if we're going to see full restoration when there's been sin. It's going to be necessary for us to preserve familial ties as a church family. And I think it's necessary for gospel power to radiate through us with potency. Now, is this easy? No, it's actually super stretching. This is going to be hard, but it's worth it. It's worth it. And I'll tell you, it's what our Lord did. Back in Matthew chapter 9, as I thought about this idea of extending compassion over sinfulness or toward sinfulness as a whole, I couldn't help but think about Jesus. It says in Matthew 9, 35, he's going throughout all the cities, teaching, proclaiming the gospel, healing every disease. But in verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And so it was compassion toward people from the Lord Jesus, compassion toward their helpless, broken state from the effects of sin on humanity as a whole that led him to heal, to proclaim the gospel, and to even send laborers into the harvest. Guys, compassion embodied for us means that like Jesus, we are moved by it, even in the face of sin. That then as a church, even when there's conflict, that we have overwhelming, lavish love where there's no grudges, no vindictiveness. Even when we're hurt, we're sympathetic toward the sinful state of humanity. Even when that sinful state has pointed itself toward us, that we've not only reconciled and forgiven and been restored, but we're willing to extend even compassion toward their sinful state. And I think compassion can lead us to ask the question, how did, how did you get this way? What happened in your past to cause you to lash out like this or to act in anger like this? Guys, if we will be and strive toward that level of maturity, I believe that not only will we bond together as a church family, but the gospel will radiate through us with power. Well, six and finally from this passage in Philemon, Family ties are produced and preserved when trust is regained in progression. When trust is regained in progression. Now, you know the saying, trust takes years to build, seconds to break, and a lifetime to repair. But I want to ask, what does it look like for us to learn to trust again? Specifically when we've been sinned against and when we've been hurt and when there's been fractures. And I think we get a little insight here. Just in Paul's trust in the Lord... Notice again in 21, he's confident of their obedience, knowing that they'll do more than he says. And then look at 22. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me. (laughs) Right now, if, if this was in a secular realm without the Lord, we might think Paul's arrogant here. 
He's saying, make my bed. I'm that confident I'm going to be released. Prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers, I'll be graciously given to you. But what I think underlies Paul's confidence here is a deep-seated trust in the sovereign goodness of God. An abiding rest, if you will, in the person of the Lord Jesus. Because of that abiding trust, he was confident of an obedient response from Philemon. He was trusting God for a release from prison. And this, therefore, deep-seated trust and abiding in a vertical relationship led to his horizontal confidence or trust. And I think this is what leads him to his conclusion. He says in 23, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, sends greetings to you. So do March or so do Mark and Aristarchus and Demas and Luke, my fellow workers. And then it's this line that caught my attention. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Guys, Philemon had a challenge before him. It's possible that he would have been thinking, Paul, do you even get it? Do you know what our family went through because of Onesimus? Not only did he leave us one man short, but he robbed us. And because of that, my family had to work extra hard. We almost went bankrupt. Paul, he broke the law. And yet, from this letter, Paul exhibits a confidence that Philemon will not only forgive, but that he will learn to trust again. Now, listen, I know that some of you have been hurt deeply. And in your mind, you're thinking, I can never trust them again. Well, I want to share with you and I want to encourage you that forgiveness and trust are different things, right? They're different. You can forgive without trusting again right away, especially when there's been someone who's vulnerable, who's been taken advantage of and hurt. But I also think that we can use this discrepancy or this, uh, this difference as an excuse, well, I've forgiven him in my heart, but you know, it takes a lifetime to rebuild trust. And so we create a little box for them. And I think when we do that, we, we remove the ability for God to do what God can do. Are we leaving room for God? Are we leaving room for him to not only reconcile and to forgive, but even to rebuild bonds of trust? Now, guys, listen, I know what, what I'm saying here and what I think the spirit is saying through his word is hard to hear especially if you're dealing with hurt here this morning. And I'm not saying that we leave church this morning and that you've got to go run with open arms and go right back to how you were with that person. But what I'm asking is that by God's strength, will you leave room for God to do a miracle, to do something in your heart and in theirs? And here's why. Because I think it's our trust in God's faithfulness that gives us the faith to trust others again. It's a deep-seated conviction that God is trustworthy and therefore I can trust also. As a church, if we will fail to do this, if we won't extend trust when we've been wronged and offended, here's what will happen. <clears throat> In a small group, an offense will occur. And sure, we may be humble about it and gentle about bringing up the offense and we'll reconcile and we'll for forgive and maybe even extend compassion, but we'll never trust again. And because of that, what was once vulnerability will result in being closed off. What was once transparency will result in being overly guarded. And we're going to start to come off as a put together church where everything's fine and it, it can come off as disingenuous and there's a lack of true relational connection. And here it is. It is not a church family. But if we will commit to a fellowship where commitments run deep and we're, where we view ourselves as a church family, tested and tried and yet still together, what I believe will happen is that not only will we stand together as a family, but the gospel's power and potency will be alive in us and through us to the watching world. If we will allow reconciliation to lead to trust again, right? Trust being regained in progression, Within our relationships, that's where family ties will be built and strengthened. And that's where we'll find true gospel unity and power. So the gospel's power is on display in us by producing and preserving a church family. And it's going to require these six things. Now for Philemon, 
and Onesimus. How did this story wrap up? Well, some 50 years later, writings of the great church father Ignatius are most encouraging. On the road to Rome where he would be killed, Ignatius wrote his final letters. And he wrote about a pastor in this final swan song, a wonderful pastor in the church of Ephesus. And the pastor's name was Onesimus. And in his writing about Onesimus, he said, Onesimus, formerly useless, now useful. Now, the name Onesimus means useful. And so when Paul had said that in verse 11, he's actually conveying a pun about his name. Well, it's intriguing, isn't it, that 50 years later, Ignatius used the same pun about the same name. And guys, it's very possible, even likely then, that this same Onesimus became the pastor of Paul's beloved Ephesus. What does that imply? Well, it implies that Onesimus did go back to his landowner or his owner, Philemon. That Philemon did heed Paul's appeal to forgive him. That Philemon did go above and beyond his request to release him. And that Onesimus continued in the faith and was actually useful to the Lord. What that means is that God worked all things for good, despite clear sin and offense and even criminal acts. It means that there's an amazing story about forgiveness and reconciliation. That though a man ran the length of the world to escape his master, he ran into the very one whom his master owed his life and in turn found spiritual life himself. Isn't that a story? Isn't that an incredible display of God's sovereign grace? And friends, I want to tell you, God can write a similar story among us. This is what will happen when the Spirit grips our hearts, when He produces and preserves a people through this process of forgiveness and reconciliation. Then and only then will there be true gospel power on display for His glory. Amen? All right. Well, let me give you just a few things to think about on the way out. We'll call them learning to live. Number one, who do I need to forgive? Maybe there's someone in your circle, in your relationships that you know you're holding on to bitterness. If that's you guys, I want to encourage you, go to the Lord. Take it to the Lord. Even if they haven't asked you for forgiveness, it's better to release it to the Lord and to forgive them in the Lord and then to pray for him. But ask, who do I need to forgive? Number two is where do I need to reconcile? And what I mean by this is maybe there's someone that you need to go seek their forgiveness. You need to restore a relationship. You need to make every effort so long as it depends on you guys. If that's in your life right now, through the spirit, I think you need to reconcile. So consider if there's somewhere where you need to seek that out. And third and finally, how can I learn to trust again? Trust is so hard. It does take a long time to build and it can be lost quickly. But we as Christians should be those who are willing to give a second and a third chance. Who, those who find our ultimate strength and confidence in God. And therefore we're willing to be vulnerable and to trust again. The gospel's power is on display in us, friends. Be encouraged. It's on display in us as a church. But it's on display when we act and relate as a church family. And that requires fellowship and reconciliation or forgiveness.